Hello, this is Angela with Progress Permaculture. Obviously not in my permaculture garden today. I am in a toddler room at a church in uh, Beaverton, which is out west of Portland. My second kid has mock trial prep for a big competition this week. And so this is where I am getting my work done. This is the only quiet space that I've got. And I wanna use my time today to talk about chestnuts, particularly a subject that has fascinated me ever since I was probably a middle schooler, which is the American chestnut blight. And you might say, Angela, why do you wanna talk about chestnut blight today? Well, over the weekend, Ruth and I went chestnut picking. This is chestnut season on the West Coast. Chestnuts are not native here. The chestnuts that we have here are almost universally Asian chestnut species. First, I wanna talk through kind of our process of harvesting chestnuts and why it's something that I enjoy so much and how we go about it, a little, little bit of tips and tricks. You can check out my TikTok. I have a short video I put up yesterday talking a little bit about some of the tools that we use. I'm trying to learn to use TikTok more, so help me out, give me suggestions of what you would like to see me talk about. Uh, so let's let's look at that harvesting process, and then I wanna come back and, and nerd out for a little bit about chestnut blight, because I think it's something really, really important not only to understanding why the Eastern United States is the way it is now, but also understanding where we could go in the future and, and the possibilities and understanding how crucially important stable food sources are to cultures, to people. So let's watch us harvest a little bit of chestnuts and I'm gonna talk about that and then I'll be back. Okay, so we're out in the Cully neighborhood in Northeast Portland. We saw a post on Buy Nothing where these very kind folks were offering chestnuts off their ginormous chestnut tree. So we're gonna show you a little bit of chestnut picking. Oh, Ruth, what's the secret to picking chestnuts? It's tongs. Tongs. And don't wear flops. <laughs> These, there's actually quite a bit on the ground. So you can see here, there's always the little dregs that don't get pollinated. I'm surprised that the um, squirrels haven't gotten all these. I think because it's such a huge tree, it's just enormous. I don't know if you can see the open chestnuts are still full. So if you get a big long stick and you kind of bang the branches, they'll fall. But right now there's already a bunch on the ground. So see, not pollinated ones. Pollinated ones. This one just fell. The reason you want to use tongs is if they're still in here, it's brutal to touch them. Oop, another one just fell. It's totally like picking green beans where you go through them one way and then you have to turn and go back through them the other way. Yeah. <laughs> or you'll miss a bunch. The production of chestnuts seems exceptionally bountiful this year. Despite competition from neighborhood squirrels, there were tons and tons of nuts for us. And so Ruth actually went and looked up after this video whether chestnuts engage in masting. Mast years are years of a bumper crop where trees produce huge quantities of nuts. Basically all of the chestnut trees in the area every three to four years will produce a larger crop. And the goal here is predator satiation where all of the predators can harvest as much as they want and there will be enough seeds left over to perpetuate the tree species. The tree can't afford to do this every year, but it can afford to do it every few years. So apparently, I learned something new, chestnuts have a mast year every three to four years. When harvesting chestnuts, you want to make sure that you are getting actual edible chestnuts, not buckeyes or conkers or horse chestnuts, which are all toxic and inedible, but have very similar looking nuts. Edible chestnuts have an extremely spiky exterior. It reminds me of teddy bear choya cactus, hence the reason we use tongs to harvest. Now, the horse chestnut has a much different look to it. It's almost like a leathery green with a few spikes here and there, but a very different look than these edible chestnuts. There are other differentiations between the species, but that's the easiest way to make sure you are eating an edible chestnut. Okay, what you got, Ruth? 
We got some pretty good haul. We got some chestnuts and some persimmons. Yeah, so I'm not sure how well those persimmons will ripen up. We just took a few. There's thousands on the tree. Uh, for my liking, I would want them more orange before I pick them and preferably after a first frost. But she said they're dropping like crazy and please come take some. So we'll see. We might come back in a couple weeks because uh, persimmons can hang on for a long time. We'll see how well those ripen on the counter because they do have an orange blush to them. But definitely got enough chestnuts for a big batch of stuffing. Oh. <laughs> okay, off to the farmer's market, right? Yeah. The homeowner actually asked us to come back and pick more later because she had so many. So we ended up getting about twice this amount because we came back after our trip to the farmer's market. So as I said at the beginning, those chestnuts, however delicious, are not native. They are imported from Asia. But I have been fascinated with the chestnut since adolescence, probably. When I read the Foxfire books, there's lots that's problematic about those books and about the author, but they are a treasure trove of Appalachian culture. And I will link to them down below. If you've never read them, really, really fascinating, I think seventh through ninth grade, I just sucked those up like a sponge. And you know, I have ancestors that are from Appalachia. My dad's family's from Kentucky. And one of the things that I found so interesting about the food culture and the peoples and their dependence on the American chestnut as a staple food source, as a source for wood to build their houses and heat their homes, how crucial the chestnut was in an area with very thin topsoil, with very nutrient poor soil, and most of the um, energy and biodiversity and uh, biomass stored in the trees, not actually unlike the Amazon rainforest, right? Thin soil and most of what is crucial to keeping that ecosystem going is the living material above ground. Out here, I have, you know, 12 or 18 inches of topsoil that I've built. In Appalachia, it's not that way, which makes food cultivation of annual crops really difficult and not as productive as other places like the Midwest, for example. So the chestnut was a staple food source, really important calorie and fat crop. It also was used to fatten things like like pigs that you would pasture in the forest. So a secondary food source as well. Now, the only example I know of, of an American chestnut, Castanea dentata, on the west coast of the United States is at the Holda Klager Lilac Garden in Woodland, Woodland Washington. I'm not saying there aren't other places, that's the only one I know of. And when I go up there every couple of years, we tend to go, it's almost like a sacred worshipful experience to, to touch this tree and get close to this tree because Billions and billions of American chestnuts are gone, wiped off the face of the earth from chestnut blight. And they are precious and rare anywhere that they grow. I believe it's something like 98% of all our American chestnuts are gone. And yet this specimen out here on the West Coast, I think is close to 100 years old. Please check out my video on the Holda Klager Lilac Garden if you're interested in going out there. You can actually see the chestnut in that video. I have a real affinity for trees, obviously as a permaculture person and getting close to an old and rare specimen that was such an important food source for my ancestors and also for my husband's ancestors who are from Tennessee and Kentucky as well. It just feels, again, like a sacred experience. I feel reverential in the presence of a tree like that. And I can only imagine what it was like when we could wander through the Eastern United States and just be you know, embraced by a huge swath of these massive trees that fed us, that kept us housed and kept us warm in the winter. Okay, so when we're looking at permaculture and we're looking at using non-native species, and I have tons of non-native species in my garden, we have to think about the greater ramifications. And this is where permaculture is something that stresses the connectedness of all things. And unfortunately, we, especially with Western thinking, we fail to see all of the connections that already exist. So in 1904, Japanese chestnuts were brought in for cultivation in the United States. I don't know why. And writing on the Japanese chestnut, which is fairly resistant or has more resistance, um, was a parasitic fungus, Cryphonectria parasitica, the chestnut blight. Now, not only are American chestnuts susceptible to this kind of fungus, 
the American chinkapin is as well. So another really important kind of keystone species. Devastating, devastating importation. In many ways, I think of other, other instances where diseases have been or invasive species have been inadvertently brought in to a country or um, a, an, an ecosystem that was unable to defend themselves against it, had no natural immunity. Indigenous Americans and smallpox is another great example. Although that was in many ways less accidental and often intentional. The first known instance, 1904. By 1940, virtually all of the adult chestnut trees in North America, gone, dead. What an absolute catastrophe for those ecosystems and for those people. I don't know if you know what life was like in Appalachia in the first half of the 20th century. Uh, I will link to some great documentaries down below. It was, it was rough, y'all, and it was a very much a subsistence uh, community. And losing a staple food source was incredibly devastating and absolutely increased the food insecurity in those communities in a way that I don't think that we can even begin to understand. There were still little pockets of chestnut, I think, you know, like in Michigan and Wisconsin. And we continued to see the wood harvested, a beautiful, lightweight, but high BTU wood harvested because there are all these snag trees, there's all these dead trees that could be harvested for wood, but they are no longer providing the kind of important habitat and the kind of food that they provided in the past. And as those dead trees were culled for lumber, we lost the snag trees that were also important habitat and there was nothing to replace them in terms of uh, a young offspring coming up. Early as the 1930s, scientists realized this was a bad scene. This was an absolute environmental catastrophe. Looking at in the span of a decade, losing 5 billion trees, they began to start breeding selectively for resistance. And that is an ongoing project that continues to this day. A lot of what drives the desire to breed resistant chestnuts and reintroduce them is, is economics, right? The fact that the chestnut was a cash crop, not only for the nuts, but particularly for the wood. Nuts for people, nuts for a cheap and reliable source of feed for livestock. The wood, beautiful, straight grained, used to build furniture, used to build barns. The tannins in the wood and the leaves were used to tan leather. This is an economic devastation to lose this tree. And we live in a capitalist society, so the motivator to restore them really has to be economical if it's gonna happen. And we've been trying for decades and decades and decades, particularly breeding with Chinese and Japanese chestnuts to see if we can restore some resistance and repopulate these areas that used to be huge forests of chestnuts. But what about the cultural and ecological consequences? I don't think we can even begin to understand what it looks like to lose five or 10 billion trees. I was talking with my neighbor the other day about, you know, what it was like when we had herds of bison roaming in the, in the billions, right? When we had passenger pigeons that would black out the sky because the flocks were in the billions. The capability of North American ecosystems to support massive, massive quantities of life that are now just poof, gone, right? Um, for me, that's something that I can get a little bit discouraged about. The chestnut blight is something that we did accidentally. We did that. People did that accidentally. And we are paying the consequences. But there are so many other places in North America where we are paying the consequences and indigenous people are paying the consequences and wildlife is paying the consequence of our intentional choices to obliterate species. Our accidental ones through our own inability to comprehend the complexities and interrelationships between species. Again, mycology was like way in its infancy back then. But when we look at our choices as humans to pretend that we're divorced from nature, to pretend that we have dominion over nature, to pretend that our choices are nuanced enough, responsible enough, and that, you know, we somehow fool ourselves into thinking that we understand the consequences of what we're doing. We look for our immediate gratification, our immediate desire. Oh, let's import chestnuts because we see the, the cash potential in an imported uh, Asian chestnut. 
Let's obliterate the bison because we can use them for our own purposes, but mostly because we can displace indigenous people and clear the land to allow settlers to move in. Let's hunt the passenger pigeon to death. Let's import Asian pheasants for hunters, gentlemen hunters to enjoy and therefore displace prairie chickens. Our actions are so short-sighted. And one of the reasons that permaculture appeals to me is because it encourages us to grow our minds, grow our perspective, grow our insight and humble ourselves so that we don't make those kind of catastrophic decisions as individuals or as society. And I think when we have that measure of humility, we have the potential to restore or to back off and let nature restore for herself the incredible abundance that we know she can produce, that maybe we in our generation and the last few generations have lost the ability to conceptualize the sheer abundance that could exist because in just a few generations, so much of it has been wiped away. But it just takes a little bit of research, a little bit of curiosity, a little bit of desire to go down a rabbit hole into our not too distant past to see the unbelievable abundance that we can support, that mother nature can support in North America and wherever you may live as well, just speaking from where I live. The awe and reverence that I feel standing close to one American chestnut, the deep connection I feel to harvesting chestnuts and being connected to my ancestors and and having a little glimmer, a little glimpse into how crucial this food crop was for them. I cannot imagine that magnified times millions, times billions. And yet we have the ability through permaculture design, through humility, through accepting the fact that we are one with nature and we need to reconnect with her and we are not above her, we don't have dominion over her, that we can, we can make a choice for abundance. We can make a choice, in my opinion, where we humble ourselves and we learn where we fit in in the natural world and use ourselves and our great expansive minds as a tool for good and we don't shut ourselves down and limit ourselves in order to wield a strong arm over mother nature. And in doing so, I think we have a lot of potential to bring back abundance. I know there's a lot of criticism against permaculturists and our focus on abundance, but I think that we have to look back to what things were like 100 years ago, what our great-great-grandparents experienced, and see that that was already ecosystems on the decline. And the upper limit is something that we are not able to really conceptualize, to really understand, but that it's out there and we can keep reaching and reaching and reaching and not reach the top of what it's possible to have in terms of regeneration, in terms of uh, abundance of wildlife. And so the chestnut blight for me is something that I come back to over and over and over again, not just every year when I'm harvesting chestnuts, but often when I'm thinking about you know my forefathers, my foremothers, when I'm thinking about indigenous history in America, thinking about imported species and, and our choices in what we choose to cultivate and bring in and the risks that that is incurring. If you're not familiar with the history of the American chestnut blight and the efforts to breed a resilient chestnut that can withstand the blight, um, check out some of my links below. Please check out the Fox Fire books. If you aren't familiar with Appalachian history and culture and folklore and skills and crafts, lots that's problematic in those books, but lots that's really rich and fascinating. I think especially for, for children, having that ongoing conversation with them, though about ways that those books are imperfect, but ways that they still can be a rich source of, of skills and knowledge and a, a way that can spark our desire to connect with our ancestors. I think is, is really good. They're really good. So if you have thoughts, if you have thoughts, not just on the chestnut blight, but like anything that's similar to it, that, that has that kind of response that it evokes in you, please share in the comments. I always read your comments and I would love to hear your thoughts. And please be sure to check out my old video on the Hulda Klager Lilac Garden and see an American chestnut in Washington state for yourself. Thanks for listening today. If you are chestnut harvesting this autumn. I hope that you have a successful harvest and I'll be back real soon. Bye-bye.